Are you in the market for top-notch digital equipment such as mills, scanners, or furnaces? Well, God, time is now. Ivoclar has introduced unbeatable rates exclusively for customers in North America. Ivoclar has made it easy for you to invest in cutting-edge digital equipment with, ready for this, lower than prime interest rates. I think that's no pun intended, but whether you're looking to upgrade your milling capabilities, enhance your scanning technology, or optimize your furnace performance, Ivoclar Digital has you covered. To take advantage of this offer, the dedicated digital specialists at Ivoclar are ready to assist you. For details on how to get in touch, visit VoicesFromTheBench.com and select the Ivoclar tab to find all the information you need to get started. And as always, we appreciate your sponsorship of the podcast, Ivoclar. Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Greetings and welcome to episode 297 of Voices from the Bench. My name is Elvis. And my name's Barbara. What's happening, Barb? Last week you kind of came in with a lot of holiday spirit. Still, 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 still. Damn, oh, yeah. I was hoping you were kind of over it by now. <laughs> well, we're recording on the 1st of December, so yeah, all is good in my world. Just ramping it up, aren't you? Yeah, and it's ramping up busy. Yeah, are you crazy busy yet, or is yeah. it just... Yeah. I'm like effing crazy busy, but you know what? It's like this every year, so I'm used to it. I'll probably come in on Sunday and catch up a little bit, but... I'd rather be really busy than really bored. So I'm happy. Yeah, I get that. How about you? We're busy. My schedule's filling up quick. It's kind of unbelievable, honestly. (laughs) Or believable. You know, I say that it's kind of like weather, like every year, well, at least here, every year it snows, but yet we're all surprised that it does and we (laughs) about it. But it's like we, (laughs) I'm surprised that we're busy at the lab. (laughs) In December. Yeah. How could this be? Oh, that's funny. I didn't yeah. see this coming. <laughs> Just be grateful. Yo, oh, absolutely. 100%. But with it being December, it also starts our big countdown to being only three months away from the biggest show Yay. in the industry. Well, the biggest show in the U.S. Right. LMT Lab Day Chicago is, of course, happening February 22nd to the 24th. We are super excited and happy to announce... And we are set up once again with our good friends, Ivoclar, in their grand ballroom. That was so great last year. That was really, really great. It was a good spot. Yeah. They gave us a fancy table, and we got to set up and just talk to so many amazing people. And frankly, I don't, I, I'm sure you are too. I'm excited to do it again. Heck yeah. I'm ready. Yeah. So if anyone's planning on going to LMT Lab Day Chicago, please make sure that we are part of your weekend. We really want to see you. Even if you don't want to be on the podcast, at least stop by and say hi. We'd love to meet you. Please come see us. Yeah. All right. So what's going on? Well, I got a question for you. Oh, God. You do all the cosmetic work. Right. What percentage of it do you think is on implants? Ten. Only 10%, really? I mean, for my personal, you know, we do like 10 unit veneers with one implant on number nine. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Probably. We do a ton of them here, but my, personally, and I'm sorry, but I, they're just a bitch. I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a fan. <laughs> my son's in the implant department now and he loves it, but oh God, I just, I'm not a fan. Sorry. What do you not like? Just the fact that there's so many different options yes. and... you gotta pull it out you gotta screw it in you gotta find the right f-ing driver to unscrew <laughs> it and there's like seven of them or more oh yeah I have to go over there and hand them my case and say can you please unscrew this for me because i'm a loser but yeah that's pretty much it other than that i think they're fantastic but for the actual ceramic work does it matter to you if you're on an abutment or no not at all. 
I didn't no. think so. No. Are zirconia abutments still a thing? Are people still doing eh, those? Not really. I mean, the I last one I did so. broke, of course. So yeah. yeah, I wouldn't really recommend them anymore. Yeah, they were hot ten years ago. I mean, everybody <laughs> I was talking about them, but yeah, yeah, you're right. I don't see too many of them. Nope. What about Emacs on implants? You have to worry about that metal showing through. Uh, I don't honestly recommend them. Yeah. If it's like on a posterior first bicuspid, maybe that's super thick facially, but no, I try to avoid it. Yeah. Not come into somebody else, make the phone call, communicate. You know how that goes. You're a communicator. Oh, sure. Absolutely. But yeah. I just find it interesting with the ceramics on top of how much it matters, but because you got to put it on an analog to hold it. You got to know which analog to use. You got to have the right screw, the driver. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Bingo. Where is our universal screw one size fits all? Well, I know you get to geek out this week, so have at it. Oh, yeah. We finally got another implant company to agree to come on the podcast. Yes. Now, don't think that, you know, we haven't reached out to a lot of different companies that sell implants. And a lot of them, honestly, would say to us, yeah, we'd love to. And then they don't follow through i'm pretty sure you say that to him on this episode too so yeah i mean i've reached out to all the big companies i run into them at lab day or some show and they're always like yeah we'd love to absolutely and then they don't Hmm. but it wasn't until barb and i were at the dtg symposium that we got to meet joel gonzalez from megagen usa We talked to Joel about our struggles to get an implant company on the podcast, and he happily agreed to come on. And with any other guests we have on from a vendor or a company, we always worry about the whole conversation would be salesy. Right. But I tell you, Joel is a rock star when it comes to implant knowledge and education. Joel likes to keep it real when talking about dental surgeries because, honestly, he's been there. Starting as an assistant in the Air Force and then working with a pretty strict prosthodontist. Yeah, we all love prosthodontists. I know, you're a fangirl of them. Yeah. Joel knows his ins and outs of placing implants. He started his implant career with LifeCore. Do you remember LifeCore? No. Yeah, it was an old implant. I think Keystone bought it out. But it wasn't long before Megagen wanted Joel to be the VP of North America. Now, Joel and I nerd out big time on all things dental implant surgery, (laughs) from surgical protocols to why he thinks we're doing too much bone reduction to why surgical guides are not being used correctly, what makes a Morris Taper implant connection better, and why Megagen not only comes in different sizes and lengths, but why they come in different core sizes and thread sizes. I love it. So join us for an implant-filled conversation with Joel Gonzalez from Megagen. Whether you're looking to elevate your craftsmanship or looking to cut back on cost, look no further. Vita MFT teeth are the ultimate solution for creating lifelike and stunning smiles. Crafted with precision and backed by cutting-edge technology, Vita MFT teeth offer unparalleled aesthetics and durability. And since Vita believes in the power of experiencing excellence firsthand, for a limited time only, they are offering you the chance to get a complimentary case sample. That's right, a full case absolutely free. Just visit VitaNorthAmerica.com forward slash free MFT. Don't wait any longer to start providing your customers a premium tooth at an economy price. Redeem your free case sample, and if you're ready to buy, Vita will even give you an extra 10% off discount by shopping online on their newly launched online store. Join the Vita family today, and we appreciate your support of the podcast. GC Initial Lisi Press is the first lithium to silicate ceramic ingot with high density, big word coming up, micronization, or for short, HDM. Which is a technology unique to GC that provides exceptional physical properties and 
the most natural lifelike aesthetics. HDM uses equally dispersed lithium to silicate microcrystals to fill the entire glass matrix rather than using traditional larger size crystals that do not take advantage of the matrix structure. The result is the ultimate combination of strength and aesthetics, making GC Initial Lisi Press perfectly suitable for all types of restorations through all levels of transparency. Most importantly, HDM technology helps ensure the product remains extremely stable without distortion or drop in value, even after multiple firings. Because if you got the shade right the first time, you wouldn't have to fire it again. And so for more information, call GC America at 800-323-0763 or visit gcamerica.com. And we always appreciate your support of the podcast, GC America. Voices from the Bench. The Interview. The L is always silent. (laughs) I bet you get that a lot. Totally. Super excited today to talk to, finally, and this has been... Finally. A pet peeve of mine for a long time of getting somebody from an implant company on this podcast. At the DTG Symposium, Barb and I met Joel, Joel Gonzalez. <laughs> Good job, Elvis. I always feel like I'm going to mess it up. I always panic at the last minute. Joel from Megagen. How are you, sir? Good, brother. How are you? Doing real well. People on this podcast know implants are a passion of mine. Oh, yeah. It's really what I do. I know it. Yeah, what I deal a lot with in my daily lab life. And I have tried to get implant companies on this podcast in the past, and everyone's afraid to come on because they they think they're going to say something that corporate's not going to like or something. Why do you think that is? I'm just out of curiosity. I mean, other than corporate, you know, being, you know, might be get, get mad at this. I mean, c- come on. Let's, what happened to keeping it real? <laughs> you know what I mean? And what happened to solving issues that we might have or finding solutions exactly nothing against implant reps but a lot of them just regurgitate the white sheet they got at their last sales meeting yes sir you got it and i love to talk to someone that can actually speak real to this you said you can oh yeah absolutely. so let's get into it but before we talk about megagen what about you how did you even end up in the dental industry very good. I, I want to kind of give you a, a quick background of me because I, people sometimes I am outspoken. Let me let me be, say that right up front. I'm outspoken. I'm You've given me out. like three warnings before we started this, <laughs> exactly. and I love it. No, that's because that's because people nowadays just don't like blatant, honest truth. True. And it's not that you're trying to be arrogant or or you know uh, what is the word condescending or anything like that. It's just I'm sorry. We have to talk honestly with one another to be able to solve issues. I equate it to a marriage. It's like, if you can't be honest with your wife or your family, well, then how can you ever solve anything? You know what I mean? So it's the same thing in business. If we can't do that, I mean, how can we solve anything? All that being said, my whole background started in 1989 when I was a, I became an Air Force dental assistant. But interesting, before that, I was an electrician. Now I, I say that for a reason. Okay. It's very important yeah. And here's the reason. When you're an electrician or when you're in construction or whatever the case may be, and you're doing a job, you don't worry about the name of the tool that you have. You worry about the tool that you have in order to do the right job. Yeah, not to electrocute yourself. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's my number one goal anytime I touch anything with electricity. <laughs> exactly. So all that being said, man, it's like Okay, I always tell people in implant, implant dentistry is very, very mechanical. It's it, you got to use the right tool for the right job. Now, let's go back in history. 1989, I was in Air Force Dental Tech. I, be, I went into the military to specifically go to uh, get the money for college. So they used me and I used them. Simple, you know what I mean? As far as a lot of people use the GI Bill. Mm-hmm, sure. Yeah, and I got out and I, uh, once I got out, I loved uh, being a dental assistant. I worked for the base uh, periodontist and, and base prosthodontist and I loved surgery and I loved pros. So then I got out, uh, I was stationed in Hill Air Force Base, Utah. Got out in, when was it? Uh, so far, so long ago. I think it was 1991 or 1992. I okay, remember. yeah, early 90s, gotcha. Right. And then I got out and moved to Southern California to Newport Beach. 
And I was working for a general dentist, you know, trying to get uh, just established there. And I was going to school full time and working full time. Wow. Well, I found out there was a, a prosthodontist implant surgeon, CDT guy, his name was Peter Worley, who was looking for a male dental assistant. And this guy was very, very difficult to work for because he's German and very, very ritualized as far as his protocols, procedures, very, very outspoken and just very, very direct. And I love that because I'm, again, I'm ex-military. And do you think that's why he wanted a male assistant? Exactly. <laughs> it hit, hit the nail on the head. Yeah. And that, that's exactly why. But he and I worked together and he, you know, every dentist's dream is, when they're in surgery or doing their procedures is to have a dental assistant who can read their mind. Bottom line, really, it's really that simple. And so he and I worked so well together. And I, again, remember, I was going to go to dental school. So it was in my interest to learn everything I could about being, ah. doing all these So you did have a plan to become a dentist. Exactly. I did. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So when I finished all my undergrads to go to dental school, he sat me down and basically said, look, what are you doing? <laughs> By that time, I was like 34 years old. It was like seven, eight years later. And he said, what are you doing? I said, you know what I'm doing. I said, I've been working here full time for all these years. I said, I'm going to go to dental school. He says, yeah, but look, he said, who runs implant companies? Because Dr. Whirling and I used to do all these surgical courses and live training at um, Stereos, which became Nobel, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So we had a lot of experience doing that whole thing, interaction, live surgeries, and, and being in front of 150 people at a time. So it was interesting because he sat me down and said, look, at your age, with what you know about implant dentistry, he said, I would rethink things and actually go back, go to, back to school and get your business degree instead, mm -hmm. spend another twenty forty thousand dollars $40,000 on your education instead of $300,000. Yeah. <laughs> right? A couple and, years instead of six more years. Yeah. Right, exactly. And I said, you know what? That sounds actually like a really good plan, right? So that's exactly what I did. I ended up getting a job with a company called LifeCore and uh, way back then in 1998. Man, Stereos, LifeCore. LifeCore, exactly. <laughs> no, no Bell, I, I, IMZ, all those old companies, right? Yeah, wow. Anyway, so that's, you know, I've been in the industry since the inception of, of implants, and it's, it's been a lot of fun watching the whole metamorphosis and evolution of implant dentistry. That's not, that's not a doubt for sure. So here I am. 25 years later, uh, the vice president of uh, Megagen America, uh, along with my co-vice president, Scott McNally here, and uh, we're based in Dallas and New Jersey. So it's been a great ride. I've joined Megagen since uh, 2008 and been with them since. And we really try to do things differently in the sense of we're super patient centric and we're super patient focused. So that's what I love about my job. Yeah. When you first started with LifeCorp, did you just start as a sales rep and kind of work your way up? Yes, sir. You got it. Yeah. I loved what I did because I was able to use my clinical knowledge and actually help people and go to go to offices, go do hands on with them from a restorative and surgical pers perspective. And so I've been training docs basically for my whole career. Yeah. So did right. you ever go back and, and thank the German doctor that you were working with for all those years? <laughs> I, think, I think every time I do a presentation, I show his picture wow. and, and said, I would not be here without this guy right here. As well as another guy. You guys are going to know this guy's name. His name is Don Cornell. He was in our yeah. office uh, since uh, 1998. So it, it was a great immersion into implant dentistry with two of the best in dentistry. So Don was your in-office technician? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty great. Yeah. So I, he taught me a lot too, brother. Trust I me. I bet. Yeah. That's what I love about sales reps that did what they're selling. Exactly. You get to go in there and sell based upon solution rather than just, hmm, this one will integrate three minutes quicker than the other. That's you know, great words you're saying though, but because I, I don't sell, I just educate and I leave it up to the person I'm talking with to make the best informed decision. Because guess what? I was treatment coordinator. So my job working with the patients was to give them the best information possible so they can make the best informed decision. It's really that simple. And you, when you do it that way, you're not selling, you're simply educating. That's it. When you're an implant company, don't you normally deal with the doctors? How do you get that information to the patient? Through the doc or do you meet the patient also? Uh, so th through the doc, typically, yes, okay. that's a good question. So yeah, through the doc, but especially Megagen does a lot of live surgical courses. We do meetings, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever avenue we, we have to sort of have that introduction, 
that's just obviously the the opening of the door. But then once we start talking about things and and talking about the whole process of implant dentistry and the whole nine yards, it becomes quite evident that we're bonding over knowledge. And that's what I love about implant dentistry because you can really affect the outcome of helping a patient get ideal treatment by simply giving somebody great advice, if that makes sense. Yeah, it really does. Great answer. Thank you. So do you work with the doctors and the staff to help them educate very the good. Patient? Yeah. Absolutely. Very insightful. Absolutely. So everybody says the team approach, right? Well, implant dentistry most definitely is a team approach, but you know, it's kind of frustrating. We've been talking about the team approach since the 80s, and we're still not 100% there as the team approach fully functioning. You know what I mean? Because uh-huh. The restorative doctor, as you guys know, uh, the restorative doctor is supposed to be the quarterback of the team, right? Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah. A lot of times that doesn't happen because the surgeon is driving uh, the implant process now by going direct to the public or direct to the patient, doing their marketing, and then they refer to, to, to doctors who want to have that referral because they get the patient, quote unquote, impression ready, which means a lot of times they're, the abutment and everything's on there, right? And they just take a crown and bridge impression and make the crown. Mm-hmm. I don't believe in that. I believe the, the restorative doctor should have skin in the game and definitely should be taking more control of the restorative process. Mm-hmm. There's always this finger pointing back and forth that says the surgeon placed the implant where the, where, where, where the bone was. I hate that term. <laughs> exactly. You guys know the best because yeah. why? You guys inherit these cases. So a lot of times, as you, again, technicians call it, it's crowned down, right? Yep. And so if the implant's in the wrong place, well, how are you going to make an ideal restoration? So, you know, and again, custom abutments, a whole nine yards, we can just open up a whole plethora of options. So So you've worked with a lot of surgeons. In your opinion, what do you think is the percentage of surgeons that actually have restorative in mind? Oof. when placing implants and Oof. also follow up what's your percentage of people using surgical guides <laughs> cuz i think these two are related <laughs> <laughs> well look i'm remember we i think i said this people are creatures of habit it's just yeah. that right now we can have the best technology we can have the best laid plan as you guys know but if somebody doesn't execute something properly guess what something is always going to be to blame, right? Yep. And again, I work in the trenches with doctors. Now, docs don't like to have that responsibility or that finger pointing back to them. Simple as that, right? Mm-hmm. Sure. So, I mean, man, that's as far as guides go, let's, let's use guys in, as an example. The surgeons using a guide have the protocol, let's call it that, of using a freehand approach, which means as you're using a guide and you're pushing down on the drill, well, you're always going to put a little bit of lateral pressure on that drill naturally when you're doing it freehand. Mm-hmm. Guided surgery, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to use a passive approach, almost like a drill press, where you're li- literally just pushing up and down. Yeah. And that's what doesn't happen a lot of times. And that's why, quote unquote, guides don't work in surgery. When they actually do work, you just got to use a different approach. Instead of you know pushing down laterally one-handed, you hold a drill with two hands and you use it like a drill press. And that way you're passively going into inside the, the guide. So there's a right way to use a guide and a wrong way to use a guide. So the guide doesn't prevent the lateral press? Uh, no. It's actually when you're, when you're pressing down laterally, what you're doing is the hub, especially if it's fully guided, is pressing against the sleeve. Mm-hmm. So then if you hear the like, – here's what I always say. If you hear squeaking – you're off axis. (laughs) Oh, interesting. Uh, Right. So think about that. If you hear squeaking on the guide, you're off axis. You you should hear no squeaking. You should be using, again, that drill press approach is up and down. But if you have any lateral pressure, you're putting all that pressure on the guide. And the guide is supposed to hold you in place. But guess what? Those sleeves are just glued in place. So no, it doesn't really work that well, other than if you're not using the guide properly. That makes a lot of sense to me, even, Elvis. (laughs) Wow. <laughs> it's kind of hurting actually yeah. i do a lot of guides and i'm like i thought the guide was just supposed to prevent that and apparently yeah, yeah, yeah. there's there's different ways to skin a cat as you get that's a great saying yep. and and the bottom line is is 
is there's many ways to, to make a guide. And what I don't, especially with tolerances out there, that's a huge problem out there right now because there's so many third party parts on the market right now. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's super difficult because guess what? Tolerances are not consistent. I'm sorry. You guys know that the best as far as technicians go. You know what works and what doesn't work. And these third party parts that are out there just do not work properly. They don't fit. It depends on the connection of the implant, but if you have a super tight uh, tolerance connection versus, you know, tolerances are pretty sloppy with the third party parts, guess what's going to happen? Stuff's going to come loose. Okay. Yeah. 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 Wow. So it's got to be meant to be nested together, everything. Amen, brother. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a lot of intricacies. And again, we, we can go down the rabbit hole of, you know, why, when, you know, where and, and how. But the bottom line is back to my military background. There's protocols for everything. I mean, in the in the military, they have a protocol for, for folding your underwear, and that's not a joke. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is that people should be more protocol-oriented initially just to learn what's ideal. Then they can, as the, here, let, let me use what the, the Dalai Lama says. The Dalai Lama says, learn the rules so then you can learn how to bend the rules. Not break the rules, bend the rules. Mm -hmm. Get it? Yep. Well, especially if you're putting a big piece of titanium in somebody's head. Let's follow the protocols a little bit. That's it. Well, I mean, look. there's there's... If you want to fold your underwear a little off, I don't care. (laughs) (laughs) In today's day and age, protocols most definitely should be followed more so than not. But again, that's kind of not happening. I see some unfortunate negative trends happening in implant dentistry, but as we all see, but uh, because you can see the results out there uh, on on Facebook University. So, Yeah. yeah. So I don't know much about MegaGen. I'm in Indiana, oh, no. and it there's not a lot of MegaGen around here. I that I that I see coming to our lab. As you know, a lot of the uh, the states are kind of rep dependent. You know what I mean? Like I was going to bring that up. It's a hundred percent, and right. totally. you, the pockets. I mean, they're town to town. It's crazy. I love Indiana, by the way. It's a beautiful area. It's gorgeous, actually. That uh, Zionsville whole area. It's, it's just amazing. Oh man, you're just talk the town I grew up in. (laughs) There you go. So I don't know much about the implant. Tell me a little bit about MegaGen. Make it a sales pitch. Tell me a little bit why it's different than other implants. I don't do sales pitches. Oh, that's right. Sorry. Sorry. So it's real, real simple. Now, let me tell you a quick story. When I joined MegaGen back in 2008, they were, you know, wanting to hire me. I had been really successful at LifeCorp for, you know, year after year. And I took a break, actually got married and uh, was in Europe for about six months hanging out with my wife, who's from, who's uh, Swedish. And we were, um, the hell are you doing uh, for six months? Just chilling. Nice. Break. Good nice. For you. <laughs> exactly. Heck yeah. Yep. You know, Hey man, why not have an extended honeymoon? You know what I mean? Mm. <laughs> but I went back to work in August of 2008 and joined Megagen. But I, I flew to Korea first to see the person I was going to be working for. And actually, I hadn't made the decision yet because I told him, look, I want to see the guy's face. I want to shake his hand. I'm going to look at him in the eye. And I want to see what this company is all about before I make a decision. So I did sense. that. Yeah. They flew me to Korea. I met Dr. Park. His name is Dr. Quang Bum Park. And I've never met one of the most passionate, most humble. I call him the king of kings because he's just a truly humble person who's always looking out for other people first. His mantra is for Megagen is minimally invasive dentistry, Mm -hmm. you know, and lifetime smile. So why wouldn't we look at things from a clinical perspective and try to mimic what we do clinically? In other words, we should always look at things from a conservative perspective first. But isn't placing implants the exact opposite of minimal invasive? Actually, no. Uh, the, do, doing a three-unit bridge is more is more invasive than a uh, implant. Think about it. Yeah. Okay. Good point. Good point. Less teeth. Right. That's yeah. Good. Yeah. Good point. Why? Exactly. So again, now what I'm talking about minimally invasive is. For instance, flap size. Do you have to make a huge flap or can you make a small, minimally invasive flap to, to do the same thing? Sure. A lot of these tunneling techniques, et cetera, et cetera, nowadays are more minimally invasive. And that's kind of my point. All other surgical disciplines go for minimally invasive. Well, why not in dentistry as well? I see a lot of 
maximally invasive cases nowadays. You know what I mean? Yeah. All sorts of bone, yeah. you know, bone, ampu- I call it bone amputation with FP3s for full arch and that whole thing. And don't get me started on that because that really just upsets me because it's like, we weren't taught that stuff. We weren't taught to just cut 10 millimeters of bone away and think it's okay and then put it on Facebook, you know, holding a coffee cup going, I'm a full arch surgeon. <laughs> that is so no. true though. God, that's well, I know, but point. I mean, come on, guys. I like, removed 1% of this guy's head. Ugh. Congratulate me. <laughs> God, that's a lot. No, we do, but think about it. If you did that to somebody's arm, isn't that called an amputation? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. If you did that to somebody's leg, isn't that called an amputation? Yeah. So why do we think it's okay no, don't get me wrong. Sometimes from a spacing perspective, you need to do that. But what I see a negative trend in is everybody trying to do FP3 full arch nowadays when you can, you know, easily do FP. I shouldn't say easily. If the case permits, you can do FP1s, you know, which are What is FP? Different. Sorry, I don't understand that. It's a thesis. FP1, FP2, and FP3. What do those they? signify? Say that again. Okay, so FP3 is like, think about like a denture that's basically fixed in place that has a lot of acrylic in the intaglio. Got it. So it looks like a denture that's basically fixed into place, right? Why have I not heard this term? I know. (laughs) Yeah. Well, actually, I'll send you some pics actually when when we're done here. FP1, FP2, and FP3. So actually, you can Google it probably and it should come up. But FP2 is teeth. So let's, let's call it either segmented bridges or some sort of aspect where you have a full arch of implants, but FP2 is basically with longer, a little bit longer teeth. Okay. Oh, I see FP, it now. Yeah, FP you're right. I Googled one, it. FP1 is obviously just like you, I shouldn't say you're born with, but as adults, we have a full set of teeth where you see the natural p- papillary form, the natural teeth shape, the natural, you know, beautiful aesthetics of teeth, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. That's what we're trying to do, bring back the conversation to FP1 versus FP3 because everybody started with the I call it the Kleenex method. And remember, if you have a hammer, everything's a nail, right? So everybody's just doing FP3 when we could be actually looking at FP1s. Hmm. So people are turning FP1 cases into FP3 cases nowadays. So basically, instead of taking away tissue to put it back artificially in FP3, we want to do just teeth, FP1. You got it. But that means you have to have more of a plan, right, to be able to uh, achieve that. So yeah. that's a very conservative yet uh, aesthetic perspective. And again, here's my challenge to everybody who's listening, which is I say this. What would you want if you were in the chair? It just it simply goes back to, you know, treat others like you would like to be treated. And that's the way I've built my whole business career is by tr- just trying to be honest with people telling them what I would expect and what my what I would want from my mother, my sister, my brother, my father sitting in the chair, the exact same thing. Why can't we do that for each other instead of just looking at, well, if I'm you know thinking about FP3 and I'm trained on FP3, but now you wouldn't do that on your own relative, but you'll do that to patients. It's like, come on, let's, let's, let's be serious about this. You know what I mean? We do some pretty gorgeous pink composite though. So... <laughs> That's great. And again, (laughs) some of those cases are necessary. But one of the prospects or aspects of FP3 is when you do all that bone reduction, here's what nobody says. When you do all that bone reduction, what do they do to all the keratinized gingiva? Because you have an excess of tissue now, right? What do they do to that keratinized gingiva? They cut it away. Yeah, it's gone. It's gone. So let me think. Now, remember, we all know the keratinized gingiva is supposed to be the security blanket around implants. So now all of a sudden, why is it okay to cut that tissue away just because we did a bone reduction? No, it's not okay. So you need to basically apically reposition your flaps to where you can you know, keep all your keratinized gingiva and recreate that seal around your implants for long-term success instead of having unattached gingiva all the way around. Interesting. So do you lecture to the surgeons and the clinicians like together or you guys basically go out and teach the surgeons? Both. We do a ton of live surgical courses. We do obviously restorative courses as well. But so it depends on what the situation is. But we just built a a huge uh, training center here in Dallas, Texas. And that's one of the reasons I moved back to Texas. I'm originally from Texas. And so I was living in in Arizona for the last 18 years. But my wife and I came here to Dallas to uh, basically run this place, uh, education center here in Dallas. And that's one of the things that's uh, our passion again, which is teaching people the right protocols for all the right reasons. And again, hopefully we put somebody on the right path so they can make the best informed decisions versus 
one of the things I, I don't like about what implant companies are doing is they just show, oh, doctor, look, this is so easy. Yeah. Just follow this little yellow line or green line or red line or whatever line and just follow that. Well, let's see. Hmm. Again, thinking back to my electrician background. Yeah, it's good to understand what you're doing as far as your protocol is. But now remember something, you're drilling into different types of bone. And there is not one protocol based upon the same consistency of bone. In other words, my point is your protocols change depending upon the bone density that you're in. Right. As well as where you're in. So, so there, you got to look at things very, very individualized from a perspective of, hey, what would I give this patient, especially when you're in surgery and you're experiencing some really, really dense bone? Well, that changes everything because dense bone is, is our enemy with implants. I mean, we want D1, uh, sorry, excuse me. We want D3, D2 bone. D1 is really, really difficult because there's, no, uh, there's not a lot of blood circulation in D1 bone. So we really, we, you really want to be careful with D1 bone. So, um, <laughs> I mean, there's many, many, many ways as far as this whole thing goes to, to skin a cat. Like I keep saying, the most important thing is let's make the best informed decision. Let me back up on this bone density thing. Yeah. So I know the D1, D2, D3, and 4, and you yeah. said D1 doesn't have a lot of blood in it, so that makes it... So D1 is more corticalized. That means obviously you have... Denser. You have, exactly. Much more dense. Right. So, so the more have, blood, the less dense. You got it. I get that. And then what does Megagen do different in the protocols based upon the bone? Is it different Very drills? Good. Very good. Not only drills, but the the actual implants themselves, the any ridge. Let, let me go back to, you asked a good question. So the any ridge is a very unique implant in the sense of you have different core sizes, you have different thread sizes. So we're really giving you the ability. So let, let's turn back. Let's let me turn this around. Hold on a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me turn this into a lab scenario, right? That's so, the only language we speak. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the beautiful thing about implants are you can do custom abutments nowadays, right? Now, why sure. do they say custom abutments are ideal? Let, let me put you on the spot. Why, why are custom abutments ideal? Being able to control the emergence profile, being able to get more angled and support under the crown. Right. And ba basically, you're individualizing each abutment for the ideal aesthetics for each scenario, yeah. correct? Okay. That's a fancier yeah. way of saying that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, think about the implant now. Why, why do we have one implant that has the same thread depth and you know the same walls and everything based upon different types of bone? You need different thread depths as well as different core sizes. And yes, that confuses people, but the core sizes basically think about a pipe. The thicker the pipe, the stronger it is. The thinner the pipe, the weaker it is. It's really that simple, right? So you're talking about the actual thickness of the implant. Of the implant, yes. So we give you the ability to choose custom implants based upon the different density of bone. So let me give you an example. Does anybody else do this? No. I didn't so think so. So let me give so. you an example. A, yeah. a five millimeter implant can come in 3.3 core, which I never recommend because a five millimeter diameter implant is just too big for a 3.3 core. We do have it. However, if you're in super soft bone, and you're going to do a full arch case, hmm. right? Gotcha. Yep. Think about that. The wider the thread, the better the... So think of a, a, a wood auger or a wood screw going into the, into the uh, wood, right? The wider the thread, the, more, the better the, the retention. So when you're in soft bone, you can do that. But when you're in hard bone, can you do that? No. And that's what people were doing with the, with the wide diameter five millimeter implant. So we came out with different thread sizes and core sizes so you can match the biology of each patient based upon what you're doing, which is really a unique thing and very, very patient friendly as well as doctor friendly. Docs sometimes get a little bit confused. So what we did is we made a cheat sheet for, for docs knowing the different implant sizes that they're going to use the most based upon biomechanical forces. All that being said, we made a cheat sheet for them to make their life even easier because mm -hmm. it, can, it can get a little bit confusing with that. So. Yeah, I'm confused. I mean, why can't you just use aggressive threads no, in all not, of them? Absolutely not. Not in D1 bone. Because when you use an aggressive thread in D1 bone, you're, you're basically killing the bone. It's, it's called pressure necrosis. Hmm. So when you, when you put a wide-threaded implant in, into dense bone, you're, it's okay. Here's a great example that I use in a lecture. So I, I grab somebody from the audience, and, I, and I, uh, especially if they have short sleeve shirt on, 
and I squeeze their arm, right? So think of an implant going into bone as you're, and it's really kind of squeezing the bone. Yeah. So you do the same thing with your arm. So all of a sudden I'm squeezing your arm. And if I held it there all day long, guess what would happen to your arm? It would die. <laughs> it wouldn't die. It would swell. <laughs> it, it would swell up. It would start throbbing. It, it would turn very, very painful. Right. Barb so then would die. <laughs> as soon as I let go of uh, of that pressure around your arm, however, you see all that blood flowing back inside. What's the difference with bone? There's no difference, right? Because hard and soft tissues. The only difference is one's hard, one's soft. They're very similar. That mm-hmm. being said, the wider the threads, the in in dense bone is absolutely a no no. So back to that five millimeter implant. We have. 3.8 core sizes for a little bit, again, stronger core, but a little bit uh, uh, still maintaining a wider thread. Then we have a core four of, and a core 4.3. So what if you have a patient who's an extreme bruxer, right? That's the thing. Let's talk about physics now. We need a thick implant in there. Wow. <laughs> you guys know this better than anybody. What are you going to do with, with patients who actually have a pair functioning problem? right? Are you going to use that smaller diameter core like you talked about? You're going to use the biggest one you got for that strength wise. Yep. See what I'm saying? Yep. Yeah. These are things you have to look at when you're truly considering all aspects of the patient's parafunctional habits as well. So I just thought it was all about diameter and length. Uh-uh. No. It's thread, it's thread depth. It's physics. It's surface area. It's the type of surface you have. It's, dude, it's, it's a lot. It's actually the thread pitch. Here, here's a perfect example. A lot of people undersize their osteotomies. A lot of docs under osteotomy is one to even two drills sometimes to try to compensate for the implant's thread design of what are implant that they're using. Well, I always tell people with the any ridge, please don't do that <laughs> because the thread design is so good that if you're trying to over prepare or excuse me, over torque that implant in, in dense bone, you actually could get it stuck. The threads are so good. Okay. So we teach people in our live surgical courses to learn and to distinguish between D1, D2, D3, and D4, and then act appropriately relative to your protocols. Hmm. So how do they figure out, other than a CBCT scan, what D the bone is? Great question. You start drilling into the bone and you notice how long it takes, for instance, to get through the, uh, the, uh, the very first drill to get through the cortical plate. Once you get to that cortical plate, it's typically uh, about two millimeters thick. So that cortical plate is super dense. And then yeah. all of a sudden, you could still, as you get through that cortical plate, continue with your drill, it could, you could still feel resistance. Or, especially if you're in the mandible, you could just go whoop and it drops because a lot of mandibles, mm-hmm. nowadays especially, are hollow, right? So you have the super thick cort- cortical area, but you have medullary bone. It's nothing in there. So it just depends on the patient's um, physiology. It's a feel. You got it, brother. That seems like they're making a lot of decisions based upon a feel. Yeah. You know? that's I it. mean, that's it. So think about it. Okay. Here's a great example. Uh, so, do you think if you go to Home Depot, the same drill is used for concrete versus wood versus sheetrock, right? Yeah. So, there, it's all different scenarios. What's the difference between the, you know, everybody used to use the, the oak and then the, you know, balsa wood and styrofoam and examples. I like to use a little bit more drastic examples because concrete, obviously, you can't use the same drill that you're going to use in wood. So hmm. we encounter the same drastic differences in of bone when we're drilling on patients' bone. Simple as that. You're assuming I'm ever going to be drilling in concrete. That's that's <laughs> funny. <laughs> concrete, wood, styrofoam, <laughs> right? Pine wood. So just I try to drill as little as possible. Right. I want to talk about the connection. Yes, sir. Because that's what labs have to deal with all the time. Beautiful thing. What do you guys do? And I don't even know what the connection is. All right. So let me, let's me let go back to the very beginning. I always like to start at the beginning because if we don't know, what, you know where the hell we started, how are we going to know where we're going, right? Yeah, for sure. So the beginning is external hex, bottom line, right? So that was the, the most mass marketed implant as far as brand and mark the whole nine yards. Well, all of it, yeah. Standard 4.0. Exactly. And you know what? That's a great point because when you go to meetings... Yeah, especially nowadays, people say, ah, all implants are the same. Like, yeah, really? I'm like, you still place an external hex implant? And they're like, no, that implant sucks. It's like, wait a minute. You just said all implants are the same. You know what I mean? Yeah. We learn so, the hard way. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so let's be real again. Connections dictate everything, right? So let's start with the two main old connections. And what I, we call this old technology because an external hex 
has a really bad reputation, right? It's just mm-hmm. because of screw loosening, screw breaking, you know, connection sucks, blah, blah, blah. Well, internal hex is still used pretty much nowadays, but what's the difference between an internal hex and an external hex? The problems are just now internal. You still have a micro gap. You still have micro movement. One of the great videos that I like to reference, uh, because again, people nowadays, they want to kill the messenger versus actually listening to the message. Hmm. Well, everything I talk about is referenced from the literature. So there's some great videos by Zipridge on the uh, on YouTube, actually. There's two 10-minute long videos that go over different connections on the market. And another wow. one is Zero Bone Loss Concepts, by the way. That Zero, Zero Bone Loss Concepts has done a great job of distinguishing the different implant connections on how to use them ideally. So that being said, the internal hex and external hex does have a micro gap. It does have micro movement. It is compa- uh, widely compatible, you know, with different systems on the market. But here's a real good point I bring up to everybody: Why, when you remove the abutment, does it stink like holy hell? Uh, yeah. Does it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we used to have a patient that had a full arch uh, restoration in their mouth, and it, it stunk so bad that we used to have to put mint oil in our mask before this guy came. Well, out. full arch, I understand, but just like a single unit. It- my point is it shouldn't be stinking that bad. It really no. should Right. With external hex and internal hex, you remove the abutments and it stinks because again, you have micro, what you call the micro pump effect, the micro movement effect, and all this crap goes inside the, the connection. That's Zipridge, gross. again, that video that Zipridge shows, shows you everything. And again, it's not my opinion. It's, it's the literature stating all this stuff. So People, again, tend to kill the messenger nowadays. It's like, no, no, no. Let's go Let's go back to what the, the, the true fact is here. Mm-hmm. So internal hex, external hex have a big, big time micro gap. So at that time, however, um, Strauman uh, tissue level implant were out there. They were pretty popular back in the day because it was basically the tissue level implant and the external hex implant were trying to battle it out, see who was going to you know, have the best uptick. Yeah, then they came out with the Synocta butt that made it an external uh, hex, and we're exactly. like, why? They made it an internal hex, right? Because they were losing, you know, was losing a lot of business to Freelet way back in the day, so they yep. they tried to make it more uh, internal hex oriented, where you can actually take a implant level impression versus an abutment level impression, which the tissue level implant was designed for, like the solid abutment, as an example. But anyway. Yeah. All that being said, Megagen has really done a great job with the Anyridge implant of combining all the features that work, basically, and put them all together. Platform switching works. Uh, Bone level implant, which basically means surface roughness to the top, works. A deep internal Morse taper action. Now, that works as well as then platform switching. Now, a lot of people get confused with the word Morse taper. Morse taper is a 1.5 degree connection that is ultra, ultra, ultra strong. It's actually too strong uh, for implants because when you try to put an abutment in there and the draw, if you put your abutment off axis just a little bit, you could get stuck because the tolerances are so tight. Oh, wow. Yeah. So the five degree uh, connection, which is an overall 10 degree with the any ridge, is, it still gives us the same morse taper action of the abutment sticking into place but you actually have to use a removal driver to remove the abutment once the screw is out because you have no micro gap now once you remove that abutment from the implant guess what there's no stink hmm. okay so because it's hermetically sealed yep so that's the difference man and again that micro pump first you have micro gap then you have micro movement then you have micro pump effect now if you have the micro gaps then that implant system by bio- biologically speaking is going to be more detrimental. Why? And even, again, back to zero bone loss. He's done a great job of showing us how to use that internal hex where it's actually supposed to be placed super crestally. But now with your more tighter connections, more stable connections, you're actually able to place those implants deeper into the bone, typically two to three millimeters below the height of bone, which gives you a much better emergence profile, much more space, everything that you need biologically to have a much more healthy peri-implant complex. So that's the, the beauty of the Any Ridge implant is that five degree Morse taper, which is, by the way, a single prosthetic platform. Everybody's talking about single prosthetic platform nowadays, like it's just been invented uh, by Neodent. It's like we came out with this, what, 10 years ago, 10, 11 years ago with the Any Ridge uh, implant system has a single prosthetic platform. And it works very, very well from 3.5 all the way to 8.0, which is super cool. Wow. All uses the same connection and the same screw. Uh, same connection, same screw, same internal hex, but the platforms change as far as the width goes. Obviously, you're not going to have the same size 
tooth uh, for the, a molar than you are an anterior. So your, sure. your platform diameter gets smaller to bigger, but uh, your internal hex stays consistent all the way across. That's why come we have that user friendliness with every healing abutment, every final abutment, everything that we have fitting every implant that we have for the any ridge, which is a beautiful thing. But let me clarify one screw for everything. That's amazing right there. As an example though, and that's a great point. When you're talking about an anterior tooth versus a posterior tooth, obviously the biomechanical forces are completely different. So we even came up with like, I call it a grinder abutment, for which is basically, it's called an S2 abutment, but it's, it's a specific molar abutment for patients who actually have really bad parafunctional habits. So not only did we come out with your thicker walls for, for Bruxer, for pa- patients who Brux, but they, we came out with reinforced abutments for patients who Brux as well. Because guess what? During the pandemic, what was happening? <laughs> People fracturing teeth like crazy, right? I mean, dentists were super busy even during the pandemic with fractured teeth. So just, just think patients are parafunctioning and, and bruxing like that, and they're breaking teeth off. What do you think they're doing to implants who are that, that's ankylosed into place? So yeah. we give docs and lab, most important lab technicians, the ability to choose what's ideal based upon the patient's parafunctional habits. So pretty simple. I think it's obvious that I'm not an implant technician, but I'm really, really (laughs) learning a lot. But all I can think of is that there's just so many docs out there that don't have a clue that are placing implants, screwing people up. Doesn't that just scare the hell out of you guys? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. This is why we we have a lot of educational courses. We have, it's at uh, www.minicamerica.com. And we're able, that's where we uh, launch, uh, excuse me, um, post all our educational courses and that's something we try to do. Nowadays, education is pretty slanted. We do, we do education from a pretty um, generalized perspective because just like I did with you guys just now, I didn't even go to, into the whole depth, but we give a whole overview of where we were to where we are now because it's important for people to understand the history of where we, where we were to where we are now and how the biomechanics have completely changed, right? So we've solved a lot of the problems of, again, the micro gap, micro movement, all these other problems. The question is, is are you going to use the product back to my electrician days? Are you going to use a product that gives you the right long-term result for your patients? It's really that simple. You got to use the right tool for the right job. Were you there when Megagen came to America the first time? I started in 2008. So Megagen started in 2005 here in the United States. Okay. So they had a little bit of a presence. I was the second employee of Megagen USA that was called back then. Right? Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Nice. Just look at the website. It seems like Megagen's in just about every region of the world. Yes, sir. I've been blessed to work with Megagen for a while. Again, Dr. Park, and I love his philosophy. I love his perspective of patients, and, and I was with Dr. Park one time, and I was uh, in Korea, and I asked him straight up, because one of the things that's super unique about our drill system is our drills cut like butter, and they're super sharp, and the drills rarely have to be replaced. I shouldn't say rarely. They don't have to be replaced like uh, every 20 times like most implant companies say, because they stay pretty sharp. And I asked him, I was in the back of his car with him, and I, was asked, I asked him, I said, Dr. Park, I said, why are our drills so good? And he said, Joel, I'm a periodontist. He said, and my most important thing to me is that the products function like they're supposed to function. Mm. That means that if we have something that is not functioning at its ideal you know, ability, it's, some, it's, it's affecting somebody else's life. And I said, absolutely. Amen, brother. So he said, so we spend a lot of money to make sure time and effort of all these products are functioning the way they're supposed to. Mm. That being said, he said, just the machine that we have to make drills, he said, is about a $500,000 machine. So he said, because I want to make sure that we're using the right uh, drill for the, for the right outcome. So again, that perspective to me is very, very not only endearing, it's the way it should be. We ought to put the patient's outcome first in everything that, as, as far as my perspective goes, we should be putting the patient first in everything that we do. So that means every product that we have needs to be tested Time, you know, everything relative to its history versus just put, trying to put something out there that, and, and sell it, which brings up a really good point. Megagen uh, in Korea, we have a network of 18 different hospitals called the Mir Clinic, M-I-R, Mir Clinic. And in Korea, they have dental hospitals. And I mean 11-story tall wow. dental hospitals. 
So one of the things that we do is every product that we have is tested in this network of hospitals, right? So it's super cool because everything we do, I mean, we're doing in vivo testing in, in Korea. And I don't know if you guys know this or not, but I think we talked about this when, when I met you guys in Chicago. But, you know, the Korean diet, they eat kimchi yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Is, is, is every day, basically. It's like their staple, right? Mm-hmm. And which I don't know if you guys had kimchi, but it's phenomenal. It's it, I love kimchi. But yeah, I've had it. You got it's that shredded cabbage, and basically when you eat it, you know because it's super thin, you got to grind your teeth basically from side to side just to be able to chew it up. Well, guess what that does to teeth? Flatten. <laughs> 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 uh, them. So Korea is a great place to do in vivo testing and, and, and you know, to, to you know, try all these products out before they come to the market in the United States. So this is this is what we do. Is there any way to get, you know, this information or do you try or maybe your company does, but get that information to the patient itself? Because, you know, patients nowadays, they, they research pretty much everything. Is there is that you see any of that happening? You know, that's a great question. You know, one of the things I, I'm, you know, I'm very honest, but both, you know, positive and, and, and negative. You know, one of the things is, is Megagen, I wish we did a better job of actually, and yes, I'm the vice president, so I, do, I definitely push my opinion, but I, I wish we did a better job of, you know, talking about all the, the wins. But, you know, then when you're, when you're trying to come across from a very humble slash patient-centric perspective, I don't like to beat our chest at all. Yeah. You know, I, I let the product speak for itself. So mm-hmm. one of the things that we've found in implant dentistry is everybody's been, you know, trying to maintain crustal bone forever. Well, with the any rage in our implant lines that we have, because they're biologically oriented implants, you actually tend to see bone overgrowth with our implant system, which introduces a whole new problem, but it's a good problem to have, which is guess what? When you have bone overgrowth on the implant system, your peri-implant complex is very, very healthy, Right. Yeah. And guess what? That also increases keratinized gingiva around the area. So all that being said, it's a positive thing to have that bone overgrowth. The only thing you have to do is profile that bone slightly sometimes because of that bone overgrowth. So that's a great problem to have. So those connections that the different connections that we have, especially with our newest implant, like the blue diamond, you're creating that hermetic seal. But yet again, aesthetically speaking, you're giving the doctor, digitally speaking, everything that they need to be able to create the ideal digital workflow and everything from Megagen. This is for you guys, uh, uh, as far as technician goes, because one of the things with I see with labs is they're using a lot of third-party parts and we have everything online at www.megagendigital.com just to be able to download, whether it's an ExoCAD or three shape or whatever the case may be. If you're a lab, you can download easily all the libraries that you need to do whatever restoration that you need to do. Sure. Oh, God, yeah. That's great. And it's free. You know what I mean? So You all have your own scan bodies? We do. You have to have your your own scan body because that scan body is tied to your library. Sure, sure. That's the problem right there. These third-party companies say, Doc, just use this. Well, guess what? When you're not using OEM parts, so back to now here's a problem. So with the five degree Morse taper action, as I said earlier, you have to have the internal thread of the abutment, right? For the screw removal driver to be able to work properly. Guess what third party parts don't have on the inside of their uh, third party abutment? Five degree taper. They're internal threads. They forgot to put the internal threads. Oh. So how's the screw removal driver? It just happened to me yesterday. Patients in the chair, right? Labs Mm -hmm. you are using third party parts, which are not recommended. On, air, on any implant company, you should use the right tolerances for whatever implant you're, you're restoring. Mm-hmm. And patient's in a chair and they could not get the abutment off because the removal driver wasn't working. And I said, that's a third-party part. And they said, yeah. They looked it up and sure enough, they contacted the lab. They said, yep, it's a third-party part. So the Megagen original parts just do not have that problem because our tolerances are, are ideal. And everything that we have is built to be able to use that removal driver properly because of that hermetic seal. So you said something about the abutment having internal threads? The abutment itself has internal threads, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, because that's not very common with a lot of systems. Exactly. With that Morse taper action, back to that five degree, the more parallel the connection is, the more retentive it is. Obviously, you get down to a 1.5 and it's ultra retentive again, which is the True definition of, of a Morse taper. You go down to five degree, you still have the Morse taper action where the abutment is sticking in place, but you need the internal threads of the abutment to use that removal driver. 
And that's what third party parts are not putting into the abutment. So my point is, how are you going to get that off? You got to get a pair of forceps. So in order to remove an abutment, you take out the screw and then you screw something else in that catches the internal thread of the abutment and then that removes it? You hit the nail on the head. It's a basically a removal driver with threads built into the shank. Yeah. Into the middle of the shank. As you screw down, the threads in the shank are, inter- are engaging the threads in the abutment. Now, continue threading downwards and righty-tighty, and then the bottom of the, the driver uh, bottoms out on the inside of the implant. And then you just continue turning righty-tighty, boop, and the abutment lifts right off. Simple. Interesting. Interesting. Super simple. But that adds an extra layer to be able to, again, do away with the micro gap. Everything that we're doing is based around uh, biology. So people sometimes, look, I tell them this. I'm very honest with people. People either love or hate the any ridge implant. The reason they love it is because of the five degree Morse taper. The reason they hate it is because of the five degree Morse taper. Does that make sense? <laughs> right. So if a screw loosens, because yep. it happens, is there less chance of a patient even knowing that it happened because that abutment is so tight in there? Very good. Now, let me go back to your point just a little bit. If that abutment is seated properly, now that notice what I just said. If that abutment is seated properly and the hex engaged and the Morse taper seated fully, there's no way that screw is going to come loose because the screw now is not doing anything because the Morse taper action is taking the effect. So the screw is not taking bearing any load. It's the abutment. Interesting. Yeah. So if the screw is coming loose, very first thing, if somebody tells me the abutment's coming loose, then I say very first things, okay, then it wasn't seated properly. Simple as that. How do you but, seat it wrong though? And very good because because if you the hex is cross hexed in there and it, you're you're kind of a lot of docs use the screw to drive the abutment down into place and that's wrong. You got to use your crown, find your hex, drop it down into the hex or whatever internal mechanism it is, and then tighten down your screw. You don't mm-hmm. want the screw to be torquing everything down. You in other words, you you want the screw to, yes to torque uh, everything down into place, but you want it to be fully seated first. It's almost like having a patient bite their denture into place versus seating it with their fingers properly. You follow me? Yeah. Now? Basically, if, if the hex doesn't engage, yep. that's your issue. You got it. Yeah. And then when they're that deep, three millimeters below bone, yep. it's sometimes hard to see. <laughs> yep. But that's why I say look, you're not going to see anything back there. You're going to feel it. So again, in our classes, in the classes that we do, we actually teach people to close their eyes and actually engage the hex that way. Because when you're in the posterior, especially, you're not going to see anything. You gotta, you're going to have to feel it. So we teach them to close their eyes to be able to feel decision versus a sight decision. It must be hard so, teaching people by feel. <laughs> ah, look, they're dentists. They, they actually have a good sense of feel when it comes to, obviously, with their hands and their feedback. They're, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that definitely works. But, you know, they're trying to see, but they can't see. So I say... Okay, you're going to try to see, so let's do that first, and then now close your eyes. And it always works better when they close their eyes, because now you're relying on the feel versus your sight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who does your uh, custom abutments? Do you guys mill them yourselves? We have our own milling center as well, but we prefer labs to be able to mill our pre-mills, not third-party abutment Mm -hmm. Mm pre-mills. People tend to focus like this is a money thing. This has nothing to do with money. This has everything to do <laughs> with third-party parts using or rather gone to the labs. And you you hit the nail on the head because if they have one scan body from a third-party part, well, that third-party company has different libraries for different implant systems. So that's what labs like. It makes their life convenient. But at the same time, it's, it's not uh, helping the restorative doctor out because, again, what's happening is things go wrong. And you got to put it back on the third party part because the tolerances and everything else are just not functioning properly. Interesting. So you sell blanks with labs to mill. Do you go yes. to the labs to help them get FDA clearance on milling abutments? Because that's a big issue in our that's a big industry. Issue. There is, a, there is a, a, a former colleague of mine. His name is Tim Torbenson. Oh, yeah. He, uh, I know Tim. Tim's a good dude. Yeah. He has that service where he can help you get FDA approved, et yeah. cetera, et cetera. Yes. Yeah, so you recommend someone goes through Tim Torbidson and it. get all that in place, and then you got it. Get blanks. You got it. Yes, sir. That's awesome. We have blanks. We have everything from a digital perspective. You need. We have. It's simple as that. 
Yeah, so real quick, we're wrapping up, but I want to touch upon immediate load full arch because that's another big thing in our industry. Uh, I it. imagine Megagen's all about that, especially with those aggressive threads. Exactly. You hit the nail on the head. And with the different core sizes, remember we talked, instead of yep. just mm-hmm. custom abutment, now we got to think about a custom implant. So with those different core sizes, depending upon the density of bone, the beauty of the any ridge implant is the primary stability. It is unlike anything you've placed before. So again, I always tell people, please don't undersize your osteotomy because the threads do their job properly. So you're not having to compensate for the threads. So based upon full arch occlusion and everything else, because it's obviously cross arch stability, you have that ability to be able to have your different core sizes, especially in the posterior where you're going to, again, want to have that maximum biomechanical force buildup as far as that goes. So you can have your different wider diameter implants and different thread depths to be able to, especially in the maxilla, posterior maxilla, which as you guys know, the bone is pretty soft back there. Sure. Yeah. And then you offer all the same common multi-unit abutments. You got it. You got 17 it. degree, 30 you degree. Well, we're coming out with our FP1 protocols and we are, uh, again, all our FP1 Oh, I know what that is now. Yeah, FP1. There yeah. you go. <laughs> <laughs> we're launching it actually at the AAID in November. Nice. And uh, we're going to be, you know, have different KOLs there and talking about, again, why are we, we're trying to turn the conversation around into FP1 versus FP3 to, again, just bring the consciousness of the discussion to a higher level instead of thinking that, hey, man, we got, if we got a full arch, we got to do FP3. And that's just not the case. Hmm. Yeah. Your multi-unit, real quick, the the same common taper and screw that is uh, com- compatible with Nobel on top. Yes, you got yeah. It. So good. Yeah, so. the cone the cone part is, but we're actually redesigning the. You know, obviously those are the abutments that we have uh, now. We're redesigning the MUA, and it's a much thicker, much stronger MUA because the the more you angle stuff, obviously that means the more you angle, the more surface area you got to take away on the angling process, right? Mm-hmm. That's just high mechanics. And, and surface area. All that being said, we redesigned the MUA to come out with a stronger, thicker walled MUA and still maintain your angles, but have the screw access hole on top versus at that angle. So we, we got something coming out that's going to change implant dentistry. And actually, we have a couple of things coming out there that's going to change implant dentistry for all on type procedures. Because one of the problems is the MUA. It's a, the MUA is back to the 80s because back in the 80s, that's all we had was MUAs. Yeah. Well, guess what the problem is? The fastening screws coming loose and the prosthetic coming loose because those little 1.4 millimeter screws are tiny. Oh, they're terribly tiny. Right, yeah. Exactly. So again, this is what's old is new again. So we're coming out with different angled MUAs, but go, that go direct to the implant for strength. Interesting. So the screw would go through the MUA into the implant? Uh, yes. Very interesting. Yep, yep. Joel, <laughs> you blew my mind today. Did I? There you, you did. Go. I considered myself an implant expert, and now I realize I'm not. <laughs> I didn't even know what FP1, well, FP2, and FP3. <laughs> I'm, I'm that much closer. Well, there you go, man. <laughs> I'm glad I could help, brother. Joel, thank you so much. This is some good stuff. I think Barb got bored, but that's okay. I learned a lot. (laughs) You did. I learned and I got to listen to you guys geek out. So I'm a happy girl. It's like when we talk to Ceramis. Yep. Totally get it. Barb, if you you ever have any questions, you got my number. You know it. Thank you so much. (laughs) Awesome, Joel. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Yeah, man. It's been fun. Yeah. And uh, we'll see you at the next show. All right, dude. Take care. All right. Have a good one. All right. You too. Have you ever wanted to learn ExoCAD? Do you find learning a new design software overwhelming or just too costly because you have to go to a course that takes a whole weekend? Even if you've never used a design software before, we have the perfect solution for you to begin your ExoCAD journey. Head over to instituteofdigitaldentistry.com and select the Mastering ExoCAD course. Broken down into three segments, the amazing Marjorie will take you through fundamentals, then immediate, and then advanced courses, leaving you with the confidence to tackle most cases that come into your lab. I personally am going through all 70 lessons and find it one of the most thorough courses that I can take at my own pace. 
and for being a listener of the podcast, if you enter the code VOICES, which is V-O-I-C-E-S, when checking out, IDD will take an additional 10% off any course they offer. And they offer a ton of content for labs and clinics. Head over to the Institute of Digital Dentistry.com for this episode show notes for more information. A huge thanks to Joel for coming on our podcast. It's no secret, everybody knows that I don't know a whole lot about implants. Kind of like Elvis, doesn't know a lot about ceramics. True that. But I definitely, I'm telling you, I did learn a lot talking to him. It was really amazing for me. So his knowledge and passion for implants is amazing, along with his no selling, educate style of business. I do like that. No sell, just educate. He does a lot of education. Mm-hmm. We understand that dental labs don't get a lot of say into what implants they get into the lab, but after hearing Joel, I think a lot more of them should be Megagen. Thanks again, Joel, for coming on and even giving Elvis an education of implant and dental surgeries. I thought I knew it. Yeah, you Apparently did. I did you not. Do. You actually did. <laughs> all right, everybody. That's all we got for you, and we will talk to you next week. Have a good one. Well, This stuff is juicy implant stuff. Laugh out loud.